Buenos días. Mi nombre es Bob Hildreth y estoy aquí con mi amigo Alberto Calvo. Entre nosotros hemos llegado a la decisión que yo hablo en español porque yo puedo hablar mejor con pobre Alberto. But in seriousness, Alberto and I are here in order to celebrate the achievements in the life of Julia Mejia as this year's 2020 Community Social Capitalist. Julia is the at-large city councilor of all of Boston. And in this role, during the pandemic, she has been tireless in trying to help and in helping people, small businesses, and the community at large. This is no surprise because her life has been an entire example of a community social capitalist. And that she came here as a very young child from the Dominican Republic and helped her mother, who didn't speak English, to get on in life, to sober beer, to survive. And she went on from that experience, which must have been very tough as a young child, to help others throughout Boston, doing some of the same things of translating and helping uh, them uh, get on in life. She founded uh, a foundation which specifically helps low-income parents through the experience of an often unfriendly Boston, from advocating for relief funds in the form of store credits so families uh, can continue shopping at their local bodegas with dignity and respect, to holding hearings about university campus police in the city of Boston, to sponsoring weekly wellness checks with Boston youth. Julia and her team are ready to help and support those most in need. Julia's history of involving parents in education comes with a passion for equity and civil rights. Thanks to Julia, as you can see, or you may not know, I've lost 10 pounds. Half of that is from cutting my hair after three months, but the other half is listening and watching every night as Julia and her daughter, Annalise, dance the night away to Latin beats, teaching me how to salsa. In serio, the murder of George Floyd at the hand of four police officers has all of us questioning how we create a more equitable society. Well, if we follow the example and if we actually follow Julia with her experience, vision, and leadership, she will lead us to a better Boston and Massachusetts. And so I say, with all the passion I can garner, felicidades, Julia. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Julia Mejia. I am uh, currently the first Afro-Latina uh, to uh, be elected to the Boston City Council. I came to this country from the Dominican Republic. Um, I was raised by a single mom who was undocumented, so at a very young age I had to learn how to fight for her and everybody else. During that process I realized that there were a lot of um, discrepancies and um, disparities between people um, who were living in low-income communities. And I dedicated my entire life to uh, being a service. You know. And um, moved back to Boston after 10 years of working in television, um, launched my own organization to ensure that parents are engaged in the education conversation and um, decided to run for office because through my civic engagement work, I realized that those who were living the realities did not have a seat at the table. And, um, you know, I was tired of people coming around my way, knocking on my door, asking me for their vote, and then I don't see them anymore. Um, so I decided that um, I was going to run for office because I really wanted to build political power in black and brown communities. And it wasn't really just about winning. Um, to be honest with you, it takes six years for um, someone who has never voted to become a super voter. And so for me, it was really about a long term strategy to build community um, power. And so, you know, I, we didn't do any of the traditional things. We, uh, um, we didn't even send out one citywide mailer uh, to get our, uh, 
our, our message out. You know, I was in barber shops, uh, hair salons, you know, laundry mats. I was crashing barbecues, baby showers and birthdays, you know, um, really engaging um, folks in, in non-traditional ways in these conversations. So it wasn't really just about me winning is really about educating people about the importance of their voice and their vote. And every space that I've been in, I've been really intentional about changing the culture of those spaces, you know, um, and working just as hard to do that while I also produce the work that I've been hired to do. So it's about shifting the culture in these spaces. And so walking into this uh, uh, new role, um, I understand the responsibility that I have to show what is possible when you elect someone who's a little bit more rough around the edges. You know, I didn't grow up in this world of politics and I don't have a filter, you know, I'm like, I just keep it 100%. And so for me, being my true authentic self in a space that is not used to that type of um, vibe has been hard because I don't want to leave myself at the door to make other people feel comfortable. And so working harder to maintain a sense of self while being in a space that was never really created for someone like me, um, it, it, it is definitely harder. So yeah, I feel like I have to work harder than everyone else just because I won by one vote. I have a lot to prove. I mean, right now my office got like five projects going on. You know, we're raising, we've raised close to $200,000 to support families. Um, we, we've launched an initiative to help small restaurants to feed elders. You know, we're working with bodegas to feed um, community residents in a more culturally responsive way. We launched a mental wellness check-in for young people and we're providing $50 towards the bill pay um, for their phone bills. You know, we um, have another project that's gonna focus on um, the arts and how do we create space for people to disconnect from the screen um, and, and utilize paint as a way to, to disconnect. Um, you know, and then we just most recently we're launching a barbershop and hair salon initiative to support our local barbers and hair salons that, you know, they have an amazing craft. They weren't thinking about their business essentials. And so for us, that's a community and that's a niche that has been underrepresented. So we are, we just launched an initiative to help support these folks. And I'm the chair of small business. So of course, everything that I do is gonna have an extra focus on making sure that these entrepreneurs are able to thrive. Um, and based on my own lived experience, I know how difficult it is for us to begin with. Um, so yeah, I go, I, I think I'm a little eager beaver and I go a little bit extra harder than what I have to. Um, and not because I have to show, it's just because the amount of work that is required in these times, um, demand that I go extra for my people because we have a lot to do. I like to connect, I'm a connector. And, and through that, uh, over the last you know, 30 years, I've connected and, and engaged with so many people from different diverse backgrounds and industries. And so I'm constantly connecting this one to that one or issue or resource. And so building that social capital has just been a natural instinct for me, but I have seen that social capital really inform a lot of my thinking as a policymaker. I have seen, um, we have convened people, um, a lot of the events that I, I produced, you know, a minimum of 100 people will show up to these spaces, you know, the most was 800. Um, and, and I say this is because the type of spaces that I've created throughout my career was really about community building and then creating space for people to recognize their own power. And I think it's through that work um, that has really helped me along the way, but it's, it hasn't been about me. I've just been the convener of this and creating this space for other people to connect. And, and, and I think that um, I always ask people what it is that they wanna do in life. And then I try to figure out how can I help them make that happen. Um, so it's, it's a passion of mine. You know, I believe that's my purpose in life is to really be a connector. Um, and so it's less about my own social capital. It's really about um, creating space for people to build upon their own power. That I launched an initiative called Determined Divas. We're single moms. You know, we were tired of elected officials coming around our way. This is how I really started doing more um, organizing in, in the space of politics. And what we started to do was we started to convene regular folks with their elected officials. 
and we want, we want to talk about people connecting and, and, and collecting, that was the space where we were able to bring decision makers into the spaces of those who were being impacted by those decisions. And what we did is instead of letting, letting all the elected officials sit little pretty in their little panel discussion, nah, we took it one step further. We didn't give them a platform like that. What we did is we did uh, speed dating roundtable discussions where we had the elected officials move from place to place and we had them facilitate their own conversation because we want to level the playing field, right? And it was that, it was that environment that we were able to create that helped constituents um, inform policymakers so that they were then able to connect and work collaboratively around addressing some of the issues that were impacting folks. That was five years ago. You know, this, not, this is not revolutionary. You know, I was doing that even when I worked at MTV, you know, 20 years ago. So for me, it's always been about voice. It's always been about how do we create space for people who haven't been heard? Because um, we're not voiceless, we just haven't been heard, right? We have a lot to say, we just haven't had the access um, to be heard. And so for me, that's why I've dedicated my entire life and career to that type of service, is to amplify the voices of the people who, who have been left out of every single conversation. And I think that that people collecting and why I know everybody's business is because I really listen. And um, by listening, you can learn. And when you learn, then you, then you have a responsibility to act. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where me connecting other people to each other is the, the magic recipe, if you will. Um, so I, as I start thinking about the plan to reopen and I think about the role that community can play, one of the things that I've been, um, that has been weighing heavy on my heart is how do we support young people um, during the summer months? Because we know that violence, there's an uptick in violence during the summer. Um, and what I'm really looking forward to is creating opportunities for businesses um, and nonprofit organizations to work um, collaboratively to figure out how we can help support young people um, during the summer months. So I've been giving it a lot of thought. Um, and again, that goes back to social capital. So I'm making phone calls, I'm reaching out to my network. I got young people engaged in this conversation because again, going back to those who are living the realities have the best ideas. So being really intentional about creating a coalition of voices to inform art thinking um, is one of the things that I've been focusing on in terms of like making this an equitable process. Um, and it's making sure that all of the key stakeholders have a seat at that table. And I even think about the whole concept of social capital. And we, as a people, don't recognize how powerful that currency is. And I think that oftentimes we have this belief that um, things only move with monetary capital. And if we start recognizing the power of the people and the power of networks, um, that we might be able to move ourselves further if we can see our own power. And, and I think that amplifying social capital and, and helping people understand the power behind it can really shift the way we do business in a lot of different sectors.